Welcome to DeFi, the podcast making the most important projects in DeFi easy to understand and accessible to all. This week we speak to Cyril Pastour, co-founder of Swap Finance. Good morning, Cyril. Thanks for being with us today. Please tell us who you are and how did you get into crypto? What is your rabbit hole story? Good morning. Uh, first, thank you very much for having me here. Super glad to share my experience. So actually, I come from a TradFi background. I did a master in finance at a business school called HEC back in France. And then I spent uh, four years working in strategy consulting at an American firm called uh, Boston Consulting Group, where I mainly focused on... Um, TradFi companies, I would say, so both banks and asset managers. After that, I started to, I participated to a program called uh, Entrepreneur First, which is kind of a funny animal. Um, <laughs> if I were to describe it, I would say it's a mix between uh, a school, a TV reality show, and Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> We want to know more about the last one, of course. No, sorry, keep going. Yeah, so basically, uh, the principle is that you have uh, uh, promotions of uh, 50 people, uh, aspiring co-founders, so 20, 25 um, tech people, 25 business people, and the idea is to uh, do teams, um, try to reiterate on some ideas, see if it works, and s change partners. So that's the Tinder part. <laughs> you swipe okay, the team okay. <laughs> if, it, uh, if it doesn't work. Um, and so... Um, Basically, I, I, would, I have always been uh, I have always been fond of finance. Um, what always frustrated me uh, in uh, in TradFi was both I would say the hierarchical culture um, and the fact that many of the opportunities to big to build something were were gone. In the sense that I think TradFi had like its golden years in the 80s and the 90s. So the like the major part of the financial system has already been built. Um, And so right now, we, the only thing that happens are, like I would say, uh, marginal improvements. Um, and it's also, also very hampered by regulation. Mm -hmm. um, so regarding my, how I came to crypto, um, basically, so I, yeah, of course, I started to be, get a bit of interest uh, in crypto back in uh, 2017 with the first bull. I mean, the, the, I mean, it was not the first bull run, obviously, but uh, the one that got <laughs> the major attention. Um, I, uh, I started to buy my, my first cryptos there, but I, I didn't follow much the ecosystem afterwards. When I joined the Entrepreneur First program, I had much more time. I started to reflect back on what I wanted to do. And when I discovered, uh, basically, that's how I, I, I started to really deep dive into DeFi topics. And that's how, actually, I, I started to, to be really involved in Web3 as a builder. Uh, so I started directly by founding my company, actually. <laughs> yes. So uh, how did you end up uh, realizing the need for what became Swap Finance? So um, basically, uh, I met my co-founder, David, uh, at uh, Entrepreneur First. And um, actually, he was much more advanced than I was on those topics. So he had started to work on the topic of, uh, of AMMs. Um, The issue of impermanent loss that we're addressing is something that's a bit of an odd animal because it's an issue that doesn't exist in TradFi and which is super big in, 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 in DeFi. And we were thinking like, why, why is there this discrepancy? It doesn't make sense. So David started to really think about that and, and he came up with uh, uh, some ideas that uh, later became Swap. And I decided to join him in, in, into this adventure because... Uh, um, I thought that there was really something to tackle and mm -hmm. something that also could uh, really bring huge benefits both for DeFi adoption and uh, for everybody that wants to uh, to make yields uh, on, on their assets. Um, we think that basically what's, what's great about DeFi is that um, you're able to democratize complex and successful financial products for everybody. Whereas in TradFi, or in centralized finance, only the richest and the m best connected uh, people have access to such products. Mm -hmm. um, so we thought, we, I thought it was a great pain to solve. Absolutely. Uh, I think you're, you might be the perfect person to di help us dissect the flow and make our audience... Some, some of them are beginners, so there are some basic financial concepts that have evolved with DeFi but still, I think that it's important to 
to, to dissect the flow of what Swap is addressing. So if you were at a dinner party and talking to someone who is new to crypto, absolutely new, how would you explain the problem? And by, by dissecting, I would say, let's start with what are pools and uh, liquidity providers, arbitrage trading and impermanent loss especially, and um, trading fees. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think I would maybe take even a, a further step back. Yeah. Um, so basically, the, the problem that we are addressing with Swap is a kind of universal problem. is how to make money with uh, more money with uh, money. <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, it's just we're in the business of yield, essentially. Um, so the way we generate this yield is by doing an activity which is called market making. The... Um, The easiest form of market making and the, the easier like that everybody almost has touched are the people that sell currencies at the airport when you want to go to a country. Basically, um, a market maker provides liquidity. So it means when you want to trade your euros for dollars or doro dollars for euros, uh, you need this other currency and you're willing to pay a premium for that. And that's how the market maker makes money. Yeah. So that's a business of swap. Um, In order to so in DeFi, what's great about uh, what's, what's great about DeFi and market making is that you can make those market making strategies um, available by anybody with uh, people providing liquidity, so that other people can exchange their assets. Basically, so that's um, that's essentially what we are doing. The problem is um, that today in DeFi, the the current protocols that address this. Uh, Uh, business of market making are not um, very profitable or at least they involve huge risks for liquidity providers. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that why there are so many uh, risks associated for liquidity providers, so risk of actually not making yields but losing money uh, while giving your liquidity to a protocol that uh, does market making services um, is that basically you have a uh, Toxic users in uh, in <laughs> in automated market makers Ar arbitrageurs arbitrageurs exactly okay. exactly so let's do one step behind so first of all you create a pool by basically pairing two different currencies and setting the, the, the balance then you have based on that ratio you have liquidity providers adding uh, li liquidity to the two tanks and who are the arbitrageurs what they do. So basically, arbitrageurs are people that have a look at all the different venues for exchanges. Yeah. Because here we are focused on DeFi, but you can also trade crypto assets on centralized exchanges like Binance, uh, Coinbase, etc. Um, so basically, what an arbitrageur does is that it will take a look at the price on Binance and at the price on, on Uniswap, for instance. And if that person sees a difference between the price, it will, for instance, um, buy... Uh, ETH at a cheaper price on Uniswap and sell it at a higher price on Binance. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, I mean, you could say this is okay. Like, I mean, it's just uh, balancing the market and making it uh, more efficient. The problem with uh, arbitrage trading in DeFi on AMMs is that um, basically the arbitrages are the only way for AMMs to know what the market price is. Instead of like looking at the price on on the other exchanges and readjusting their, their prices internally, they are paying actually arbitrageurs to do that because the value that's extracted by arbitrageurs comes from somewhere. Yeah, um, it's not magic money. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that absolutely. Appears. It comes from the pockets of the liquidity providers, who uh, actually f uh, consequently um, lose a tremendous amount of values. Well, yeah, value. and. On top, this reflects on trading fees. How does that happen? Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a great point. So basically, because you have these arbitrageurs that are extracting a lot of value, um, trading fees have to be higher on traditional AMMs in order to compensate partially the losses that have been uh, uh, made by liquidity providers. At a protocol level, you mean? Yeah. yeah. So that's why currently, like the fees that you can see on, on DeFi protocols, on AMMs, are actually much higher than the fees that you have on centralized exchanges. Mm -hmm. um, so this is reflected both in terms of slippage, yeah. which is the amount of premium you pay when you execute a large trade, and also on the like variable fees, that uh, not variable, but like a fixed fee, sorry, that you get when you trade on an AMM. For, so um, each time you trade, you, you, a portion of your trade 
uh, is paid in fees essentially to 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 benefit the liquidity providers. Yeah. So basically, what Swap does is taking out the role of arbitrageurs from the maths. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So basically, what we focus on one one of our core um, our principle, one of the core principle behind our approach is to reduce the value that's extracted by by arbitrageurs. You cannot completely remove arbitrageurs, mm -hmm. uh, but you can strongly reduce it. And the way we do it is we use uh, oracles. So chain link, think, okay? Yeah, exactly, chain link. So you can think of oracles as data streams that are uh, brought on chain by a provider, and essentially they allow us to look at the price on other venues without having to pay anyone. Um, so we are saving a lot <laughs> on on the uh, on the arbitrageurs costs. Oracles bring another set of problems, uh, notably, which are <laughs> quite technical, actually. The big problem that they bring, notably, is called front-running. Um, so it's uh, linked with uh, MEV. Um, basically, when you publish uh, an Oracle update on-chain, the, uh, the, the, the Oracle is pushed in what is called the mempool, mm -hmm. so which is the place where all the transactions ha arrive before they are validated and put on-chain. Okay. And some sophisticated players can basically take a look at the mempool on the transactions that are going to happen and pay more fees to be prioritized and profit from the fact that they know that the transaction is going to happen. Right. And so, for instance, they can, yeah, they can extract value Notably, when there are big differences between two Oracle updates. Um, so, at Swap, uh, the most revolutionary uh, part of our approach is um, we have a, a mechanism to fight front running uh, by trying to anticipate what are going to be the variations in the Oracle price. So, we run uh, complex models that are used in uh, traditional finance uh, and that we have simplified and adapted to the DeFi context which are called um, stochastic calculation-based models. Uh, and they are based on, uh, if you want to know everything, they are based on geometric Brownian movement. So that's a lot of buzzwords. But essentially what it means is that um, we are trying to assess the risk that an Oracle update is going to be very different from the previous price. Okay. Um, and if we think that the Oracle update is going to be uh, very different, we increase our prices so that uh, if someone wants to front run, they will have to pay a high fee. So it's not profitable for them to front run anymore and they cannot extract more value. And when we think the risk is low, we reduce our price so that it's very cheap to trade on our platform and that people trade and are able to exchange value and generate fees for our liquidity providers. Okay. Uh, a quote from your documentation. Swap is the first market neutral automated market maker. How can be AMMs not neutral? So, so basically... Um, we have to come back to what an MEM does exactly. So imagine you have a pool with uh, um, 10 ETH and 10,000 USDC and one ETH is worth 1,000 USDC. Um, an AMM will um, basically base the price out of the quantities in the pool. Mm -hmm. So each time there is a change in someone trading, it affects the price because it changes the balance of the, the pool. Uh, but also when there are price variations in the market, the balance of the assets of the AMM changes. So for instance, if the price of ETH moves to 2,000 USDC, an AMM will have a balance of, uh, will sell continuously ETH, like they are always selling the asset that performs best. Yeah, yeah. So you will have approximately seven ETH in your pool and 14,000 USDC. So you are rebalancing your quantities, so you're not market neutral in the sense that, uh, you're not neutral in the sense that you change uh, the, uh, the, the, assets you are, you, the assets you are exposed to. Okay. And what we do at Swap is that we keep the same exposure no matter the prices, approximately. Like, there can be small variations, but they are, like, I would say, neglectable. Um, so, so basically, if I, if I were to say it in an, another way, if you take the sec same example, if you have 10 ETH and 10,000 USDC, uh, you will keep having 10 ETH and 10,000 USDC even when the price is 2,000 USDC. Uh, yeah, of free ETH is 2,000 USDC. So in this example, uh, a traditional AMM will have um, uh, a, a total value of the portfolio of 28K because they uh, kind of dumped the ETH along the way, whereas uh, in Swap would have a value of 30K mm -hmm. when the price of ETH is at uh, 2,000 USDC. Okay. If there are any, who are Swap Finance main competitors and what does make Swap unique? So there are different ways to answer this question. Um, I think the first thing that we sh should understand in order to take a step back is that uh, Swap is a yield solution. So as a yield solution, we are competing with every other uh, venue that allows to generate revenues with liquidity. So that includes, of course, like all DeFi products that promise this. 
So uh, other AMMs, but even solutions like StakeDAO in a way, yep. or um, Aave, um, uncollateralized lending products, but also outside of DeFi. So traditional DeFi funds, yeah. traditional funds, etc. Um, if we want to restrict that a little bit, um, I think it's more interesting to compare Swap to other like yield products in DeFi. So the first thing is AMMs, obviously. So what are the difference? What's the main difference between Swap and other AMM products? I would say is that, uh, to me, AMM products are more casino products than investment products. Um, in the sense that when you compute the expected return of uh, tradi like of uh, traditional AMMs, they are uh, neutral to negative, so slightly negative, I would say. Um, but the risk that you take when you help in a, in a, in a traditional AMM is huge. It's very important. Uh, swap is approximately 10 times less volatile than traditional AMMs. So what I mean by that is that when you help in the traditional AMMs, you have high chances to make a lot of money, but even higher chances to lose a lot of money, which means that uh, the payoff is not very different from playing the roulette in the casino. What we are doing with Swap today is a strategy that you could qualify as low risk, low return. This is the first product that we have on the market. We are going to develop additional strategies with different risk parameters so that every type of uh, liquidity provider can find the right um, strategy for his appetence for, for risk. If we compare that to other products on the market, for instance, uh, collateralized lending products like Aave or Compound, those have a more, like a, I would say, a very low risk, very low returns uh, like, um, profile. So for instance, Swap is approximately two times more volatile than uh, Aave mm -hmm. um, and uh, has returns which are today around like four times the returns of Aave on the assets that we support. Um, another product we could compare ourselves to are uncollateralized lending products. So those would be more like high risk, high return. Um, so it's a, it's, it depends on your appetence of, for risk and your yeah your your investor profile is right 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 right. If you had to evaluate potential risks and vulnerabilities in swap finance, what would they be? So uh, I mean, those risks are, are very st clearly stated in in our documentation. But basically, there are two main types of risk. I would say. Um, so first, you have the smart contract risk, uh, of course, which is I think uh, the one that everybody fears. Um, so in order to to reduce this risk to the maximum, we've been audited by. Uh, by two of the best uh, security firms in the DeFi space, so chain security and runtime verification. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a very st uh, strict OPSEC policy in our team. Uh, and of course, like we spent a lot of money on those audits. I, I, d I don't want to say it because... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, it we know how much it costs. It, it, yes, it, it helps me a lot every time I, I think about it, but I think it's, it's, really, uh, it's really important to, to dedicate such uh, means to security because uh, is the first thing that's important for, for LPs is to ensure that the capital is preserved. The other risk that you need to think about when you try to assess uh, a strategy is the financial risk. So how is the financial strategy working and what are the, the underlying, underlying risks, etc. So basically, as I said a bit earlier, uh, Swap is more like a low risk, low return strategy in the sense that um, the volatility of our net daily returns is, uh, is, very, is very low. It's only two times uh, more volatile than Aave and it's 10 times uh, less volatile than traditional AMMs like Uniswap, uh, V2. V3 is probably even worse because it's on leverage, so it's, it's even worse. What you need to understand also is like what are the underlying uh, things that are making the risk. Um, so at Swap, our revenue driver is the volume of liquidity that's traded on the platform. Mm -hmm. So if, if the market has like a high volume of trading on a given day, it means that our revenues are going to increase. And the moments where our strategies tend to perform less good is when you have a black swan event in the market. So a black swan event is when you have a huge unexpected drop of a value of, a, of an asset. And it's actually the same driver of risk that you have on uh, collateralized lending products. When there's a huge black swan event, you, you may have like uh, difficulties in liquidations, okay. which means that the liquidity providers can be at risk. Yeah. So it's a different risk driver than other protocols. For instance, uncollateralized lending products, it's more about uh, is the market doing well or not? If you start to have like a, an economic crisis, uh, all the borrowers may start to default and you have a, 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 reaction, a chain reaction. So it's important when you're an LP to really understand how big is the risk and what are the drivers behind the risk? Because you want to diversify the risks you are exposed to. 
Okay, how do you think be your traditional finance preparation education has helped this more organic vision of DeFi? I think it's uh, I think it's very important. Um, I think that today in DeFi we have a lot of skills, very skillful people around um, smart contracts, uh, simplifying financial primitives, building decentralized products. But I think we need more expertise on the financial side of things. So uh, both on the maths and also on making those financial concepts uh, accessible to users. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's going to be a very important point if we want DeFi to reach uh, bigger scale. Absolutely. Uh, what have been some of Swap's most painful challenges in the past and maybe in the present? Could be regulations, could be anything that you want to name. So yeah, regulation definitely uh, is a is a is a topic in DeFi, um, especially about like where to settle. Uh, there are like super big implications and uh, and tough choices. So on our end, we choose to uh, to settle in France uh, for starters. We'll see how it goes, but for now, we'd, we'd rather stay in France, uh, which is our uh, where like most of the team is based. Yeah. In terms of uh, other challenges, I think like every protocol, there is like the cold start problem. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, how to attract users, how to attract liquidity when you don't have trade volume, how to attract trade volume when you don't have uh, liquidity. So like we're we are still uh, figuring that out, but uh, we are. Uh, I think we 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 already have good milestones because uh, we celebrated our uh, 1,000 uh, LPs uh, this week. So it's uh, it's already a first uh, great milestone. Um, yeah. Okay. Is there anything holding the project back right now, if any? And what what would you like to see working better? Today, I think it's mostly capacity. We have so many ideas. So many things that we want to develop, uh, but we just have our bare hands. So right now we're we're trying to to scale the team in order to better tackle all of these things. Um, but uh, for instance, we're working uh, hard on the, our V2, um, which is going to to be released uh, in the middle of next year. Um, we are trying to also to reach out to more LPs to show them what we are building and uh, our first results that are very exciting. Um, we have lots of things around product. We want to make our product better. Like there are so many challenges that we want to tackle: integrations with other projects, um, collaborations with uh, great organizations like StakeDAO, for instance. Like many exciting projects in the pipeline. And um, yeah, our, our biggest uh, uh, hurdle right now is how we prioritize these things and how we can execute as as much as we can and as as best as we can. Mm -hmm. DeFi has woken up the bear, not the bear market, but the actual bear. Governments, institution. We know a few cases recently. What are your forecasts in terms of relationships between governments and the DeFi ecosystem? Do you think that we will see more of? Alex uh, Pertsev Tornado Cash cases and uh, what do you think will help soften this uh, relationship? I, I don't know how, how it's going to evolve like the, the actual relationship um, what I think though is that and it, maybe it's a controversial state, but, statement but I think um, that if we want DeFi to be to replace the financial system to be the backbone of the financial system which is my objective um, we'll need to work with regulation and we'll need to have a clear regulation framework that's, that makes sense, of course. Um, so I think we'll need to work with the governments. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple. Today, DeFi is only, like the, the total TVL in DeFi is only the size of the 40th American bank. The financial system is mostly made by institutional investors. And those in investors, they need uh, a regulatory framework that's stable uh, in order to engage assets. And if we don't have such framework, I think we will have trouble expanding uh, DeFi. We can grow with retail, of course, and I think it should be a focus. But um, we should not forget that, in the end, this market is primarily made by, by institutions. Yeah. Partially, you have already answered to that by highlighting the V2 release. Is there anything more you are excited about for the future of Swap Finance? Uh, yeah, as I said, so we have uh, the V2, which is going to be a, a huge milestone for us because basically the V1 of our product, which already has uh, one of the best performance in terms of uh, AMMs in the whole space, has been uh, designed and, um, and delivered by David, my co-founder. Mm -hmm. um, for the V2, we've partnered with what is maybe the best team of researchers in market making 
in the whole DeFi ecosystem. Okay. Um, so we've partnered with uh, mathematicians uh, that uh, that that come from TradFi. Um, so our like one of them, for instance, his name is Olivier Guéant. He's uh, he's a mathematician. He did his PhD and founded a company with someone who had the Fields Medal, mm -hmm. which is a Nobel Prize in mathematics. And he's been uh, he's been a researcher in in market making in TradFi for um, the past 20 years. He has more than uh, 2,000 citations on uh, <laughs> on Google Scholar. Okay. And so those guys now are building with us the V2 of our protocol. It's going to focus on improving our current strategy, which is a low risk, low return strategy, but also developing other products. Uh, as I said, to 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 appeal to other types of investors who have a more who are less adverse to risk. Uh, so we were planning to develop a, a high risk, high return strategy. Uh, other things that really excite me are like all the collaborations that we're going to do in the in the coming new months with uh, uh, different kinds of DeFi protocols and uh, uh, DeFi organizations. So of course, uh, StakeDAO is uh, is going to have a, a huge part into that. So very excited about all of this. Um, I think yeah, DeFi is about uh, building uh, something together, and uh, the composability for me is something that has tremendous value. Mm -hmm. So I think that collaborations with other projects are key to to generate uh, value for, for the whole ecosystem. Absolutely. Cyril, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much.